my name is Alayab Lore, as uh, been shown in the slide. I work with an organization called Ujama Community Resource Team, a team in Tanzania, the northern part of the country. And I also am the Goldman Environmental Prize winner from Africa this year, um, which has been honored in uh, San Francisco in April this year. And uh, it's also good to see that um, other people are looking what you are doing on the ground. I've been doing this work for more than 17 years, and I never thought that somebody's looking for me. And until the time when the international recognition started to come out since 2008 from uh, an, an initiative called Equator Prize Winner, which I won also in, in 2008. That's me. Uh, now I'm going to take you through um, uh, an initiative that the organization is working, is working through securing of pastoralist land and natural resource rights in the northern part of the country. Um, in the, my presentation heading is talk about land use, but I'm going to give you a different stories in regard to that. When it comes to land conflict, as an introduction, we do have uh, in uh, our pastoralist context, we do have two main categories of land conflict. One is about boundaries or territorial conflict. Two, it is about natural resources uh, use conflict. Those are the main. We may have other little, little um, uh, conflict of natural resources, but those are the main. When you talk about um, boundaries conflict, um, we do have uh, number of issues that are also coming from that. One is those conflicts that are caused by the um, the autocidal or, or external people coming to the land and they start to push forward just the boundaries for their own interests. That is one of the issues when I talk about the boundary conflict. But uh, there is also um, issues that the boundaries is been demarcated long ago by the colonial government. And sometimes these boundaries are too more political. But when it comes to the reality on the ground, the local people will not be able to understand. For example, my community, the Maasai tribes, we, we do have our own territory that go all along to neighbor country, Kenya. But you, when we do have our political boundaries, which divided these two countries, Kenya and Tanzania. And uh, in terms of ad administratives, we have to understand. But in terms of use, those are the boundaries that is really meaningless. Because my cows can cross to Kenya to access resources. And the Kenyan cow can also do the same so long they will have uh, agreed um, uh, um, MOUs between these communities. It's not a random thing. Because um, sometimes people are saying pastoralists are moving or they are moving from one point of another with no reason. But I want to tell you, any movement of pastoralists, they have, they have meaning. We call it um, uh, mob mobility which is a, a key strategy for our own uh, livelihood. And uh, we, in order to have a complete system of pastoralism, you need to have land and natural resources as one pillar. You need also to have people, which are the pastoralists themselves, and you need to have a cow. So <laughs> the composition of those three pillars, it brings you to have a, a complete pastoralist. That's me. And uh, uh, when it comes to the land struggle, and uh, when, it come to, when it comes to land struggle, it is where we do um, bring the whole entire community together and try to discuss about our issues that are pressing the community in terms of the land conflict or land grabbing. And this is the point where 
the, we do have what we call a, a, a technical resolution mechanism, which you normally in obtain in university level or from different technicians. And we do have what we call traditional uh, conflict resolution mechanism. And uh, for us, we have been uh, trying to, to mix all aspects and to understand which one worked the best. And we found that uh, the technical one that I obtained from the universities, okay, it's good, but we found in our culture that it's not sustainable. It is only good if you do have a chain of people facilitating it, and it's very expensive. You draw a model, you implement it, and also you ask for consultancy on how to implement it in proper way in order to make sure that those community are able to agree on the conflict resolution mechanism. But the traditional ones is simple to follow because it does not have all this matrix. Just easier and it is community owned. You use the traditional ways of mechanism to understand it. And once it's, once it's adapted, it's forever. And that's what we call means of sustainability. When you, we do also have a, a concept of land grabbing. That's one of the very major concepts. And also, in relation to the slow fish, Today I had a lot of different presentations, which was a very great presentation. But I need also to let you know that these things, uh, we do have a lot to share in common. What? When you talk about uh, um, maintaining or protecting the rights of fishermen in an individual base, that is something that it might not be have a really meaning if you don't also think about communal uh, uh, reserves for fishermen. Individual uh, ownership of um, uh, reserves for fish um, can, can last longer if we do also have a concept of communal ownership. If you have your own um, uh, 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 fish, fish uh, zone, it's your own. And you can also declare or sell any time to, to somebody else. But once it is communal, it's, a, it's our property and not your single property. So we, all of us, we have to protect it in order to make sure that it is for us today and for future generation. And this is the concept that also we try to come up to secure our communal lands. And these are the challenges that they face us. On the land grabbing, we found that we do have uh, external land grabbing caused by private uh, hunting or two operators, large scale farmers, uh, mining companies, and the establishment of protected areas, that's National Park, Game Reserve, ETC. When you, come, when you talk about hunting companies, there are other companies when they, because in our country, you need to apply for um, a hunting uh, concession, which it is legal. You go, you operate, and you hunt. But other operators, they found that they, they want to get a permanent ownership of land within the local community land. And they forget about their original goals of come and do their sports hunting and go. So, with that interest, now they start to bribe local leaders and find few individuals who has uh, individual uh, titles and then they buy the land in a very cheap price and they sell it in a very, very high price. And I hope this one is also uh, got the same with the fishermen. Uh, again, when you talk about uh, large scale farmers, these are the people who are going to our land. They acquire very big thousands of hectares through individual titling, buying land, and uh, applying uh, application of land into the national level. They buy lands, 
And uh, after that, they grow uh, exports, uh, crops, flowers, and buy fuel, and not food. So, well, we might say that, okay, if it is food, we can also benefit out of it. Then we found that at the end of the day, we benefit nothing. We lose our land, and we still feel uh, hungry, because no food. You may, have your money, you may have money in your pocket, but you don't have food to buy. That's yeah, happening on the ground. We're talking about mining. The companies, the laws, especially the land law in our country, which is among the best laws in my country, because we said it gives rights to the local communities, but it doesn't talk anything, because they said land is anything that we see on top of the soil. But anything beyond that, it's not land. So again, we found our land is just going full in the hands of miners, mining companies. And when we say it's our land because we have titles, you say, but we don't have title of mining. So now you, we found that we cannot only deal with the one aspect of law, but rather we need to go through different laws and policies that are governing land and other natural resources. And we do have a very great team of lawyers within an organization, which are, their daily work is to go through day-to-day -day challenges that are coming from land and natural resources, simplify them in our very local language, go through the different community meeting and do a training and try to observe what are the community view and share and also draw a lesson learned documentation what we can be using it for lobby to different uh, government bodies and policy makers. Establishment of national parks. Yeah, many of the people in the West, they travel a lot and they like national parks. But also this national park have a uh, historical, bad historical grounds to our communities. We are conservators by nature, as must say, and that's why we are also vulnerable to this aspect of the, the creation of the National Park and Game Reserves. Because other communities have changed their land use to tall building, to uh, farming areas, to something else. But for us, we leave it natural. So once the country is eager to establish a game reserve or a national park, the first area to go is to a natural is to a place with a, a natural resource appearance, and that's Maasai land. Now they, have, uh, they are so clever; they come up with a different uh, way of of taking that land. One is through contract. When uh, a government, the colonial government, was starting one of the very famous national park called Serengeti National Park, the colonial government said, you must sign. We, we want to sign a contract between you and the government that you will get out from this land toward a neighbor land. Just squeeze yourself a bit. Then we, then we get this national park. And you will never be evicted from now to onward. And then you say, oh, okay. What about the conversation? They say, but it's also for your benefit. So once we create a national park, we make sure that the natural resource benefit has to start with you first. And you say, okay, that's good. Let's see. That is back to 1959. And then all of a sudden, 61, we get an independence. All the colonial government back came, went back to UK, settled their life there. And they leave us with our own government, which says the UNESCO and the other big conservation international organization say in order for Tanzania to be more good and more economical and more environmental, whatever, you need to have more national parks. Yeah. Then the country start to say now we go up to 35% of the total country land has to be changed into the national park. That's the real situation now. The almost the 60% of the whole entire land is from the Maasai land, from the 
And now he said, but we have our contract with the colonial government that we've never been evicted. He said, that's the colonial. Now we are talking about our government. <laughs> again, we say, oh, he said, so what do we do? Now we come up again with a concept uh, called, uh, we come again with a concept called, uh, um, uh, we went back to our lawyers and they say, now guys, we are not safe. We are no longer safe anymore. According to what the government said, these are the situation. What do we do? Then we went to them and say, first of all, we want to use the Land Act of 1999 to safeguard our land tenure security. Then they said, unless you do proper land use, you do um, proper governing by laws, zoning, mapping, then we will give you a certificate. The process is, is if it needs about 32,000, 32 million fishings, if you convert with dollars, 2.1. For one village to acquire a village land certificate, that will identify that you are proper, you are owning land illegal. And you say, okay, let's pray for that. We went for donors, they cry all over for the community, we want for that. And then later they said, this certificate is only for the outside boundaries. But when it comes to within the village, let me show you the map of the village. No, that's one. But these are the one of the sample of the land use plan map. That until the village land looks like this one, it is the only time you can say, now you are, you are going to be given a village land certificate. Now we said, okay, that's fine. Then we go for this. And then they said, okay, this certificate, it's only protecting the black line outside the boundaries and not within, within the boundaries. And I came to say, what's this again? Okay, now, what is in? Inside the map, we have a green color. Green color is a grazing land for personalist community during the white season. A little bit color, the gray one, gray one here, it is a grazing land for pastoralists during the dry season. But the, which color is this? Brown. The brown color, it is the land that belongs for cultivation, farming, uh, gardening, and everything. And the purple one, it is a, a land, it's a land that belongs to settlement and the uh, schools and other uh, community needs, uh, whatever. Then they said, we want uh, individual certificates are allowed here. Individual certificate for your own plots, your own garden, certificate for a school, certificate for a church, certificate for whatever. And then we told them what happened to the group that, like Masai, who own land communally. Because for us, individual certificate becoming uh, be becoming not a priority because, you know, the first time when we, they introduced, because this one was coming from the politician, they said uh, every individual need to have individual title so that they can be able to acquire loans for the better improvement of their life. If you want to graduate, they use Graduate from the poverty. The only way is to get your own, your own individual certificate. And then we say, which, which concept is this? And then I read from different uh, um, uh, academicians, and I found the concept was introduced by somebody called the Soto, the, an economist from, uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> then I said, okay, if it is him, because I did not get really time to talk to him at all, but I, I'm also looking for him, if I can be able to meet him one day. Let me also try to think about it. And then our fellow brothers and sisters go for that, because you know somebody trusts their politicians. What they said, they run to that. And then they get their certificates. And later on, they went to the bank, and they get lots of loans, different, you know, according to the size of land. 
But there's a very faint line within the loan statement which says uh, conditions and whatever will be taken into account. After you took the loan, when you, when you try to pay it back, condition and whatever has to be taken into account. And the people found that the interest of taking back the loan is becoming two times from the loan that you took. Then people failed to, to pay back the loan. The land go to the bank, to the government, to the investor. People remain landless. Then we say, for our community, this is not the way to go. And I also think this, so that you fisheries has to take in mind some of the things that I'm talking about. Because we do have what things to share in common. So now, we said, what else? Then now we created what we call uh, a certificate of communal. Yeah, this is the one. They call it certificate of customary right of occupancy. Now we found that this is the last option that we have to go to at this point. And this is the initiative that makes me to win the Goldman Environmental Prize. Then we went for it. We start to go find a, a, a laws a window that it can allow us to work around it. We found that the law is actually talking about the rights, but not specifically the, the rights to the communal certificate like this one. So what we did, we start to lobby. We went to commissioners of land and we have a seat together with them and say, guys, this group is a pastoralist group which is which providing milk and meat, which it's a food that, you know, in our country, those who have visited Tanzania, we do have a very common food called nyamachoma. Nyamachoma means roasted meat. Nyama choma. Roasted meat. It's a, one of a very common food for our politicians. Before they drink beer, they have to go for it. <laughs> then we said, okay, if you like, if this is your favorite food, and you like beer, and you like nyama choma, then you, the food that you like are in danger. Because cows have nowhere to eat anymore. We are able to provide the meat and milk all over the country. Wherever you, wherever you go in our country and you have your own money, you can be able to eat in your machoma or milk. It's found. And only ranches are providing 3%. The rest of the is from the local producers. That's including myself. Now we said, okay, your food is in danger, so you have now to work around it. And the only way to secure it allow us to go for communal certificates, which also will provide us uh, free mobility from one point to another. It can also allow us to move from one point to another to allow grass to grow, to avoid the to avoid deforestation and soil erosion, overgrazing, and diseases. And also remember, not every single piece of land is enriched in, uh, in uh, ecology. It's difficult to get a single piece of land with uh, salt lick, palatable grass, water, and everything. So you have to move one point to another. And then they said, okay, from linking it to the food, now I understand. <laughs> Go for it. Say, yes, now we have to raise up the flag and keep the ball rolling. Now, after that, <laughs> need to go again back a bit to this map. We come up again with uh, something called cross-border land use plan or connectivity. Uh, Black line is a, is, is a village uh, boundaries. So any black line within is a village boundaries. How we said, although these administrative boundaries are there and we understood, but we need also to oversee what are the use of land to your neighbor to avoid the conflict? Because once here is grazing and here is farming, when you cross it, there is conflict. The animal will eat crops and it's no good. We need to create a win-win situation where everybody within the local area will win. Then on the farming area, 
We have to, it has to be connected. Because the grazing land has to be connected as well, all along. And then, he, there, it's a point where we reduce conflict within the community. And then we went uh, far from there, that, okay, in order to make sure that this system work, people has to be well uh, improved economically. How do we go for that? We did also, we started also an initiative of translating communal resource sharing into communal resource benefit sharing as well. <laughs> so apart from sharing land, pasture, so resources, also money, that these areas that are, uh, that are potential for grazing is also potential for tourism. Then we said, if it is like that, now any tour company that's operating on these areas, they have to, they have to engage into a fair contract between a tour operator and the entire community. It's not an individual thing, it's a communal. The money that is collected from there has to go for the community account and not for individual pockets. And uh, the money that's collected from there has to be spent after the plan was approved and agreed by the village general assembly. So it is our, our own money and not single individual money. We also want for that. That's really a, now a, we started with a zero for many villages. Now the village goes up to $100, um, $1,000 in a year. So we found this is a very viable economic option. Um, something else that I wanted also to, explain, to talk to you guys, once you have all this plan, they, you need to have a local uh, natural resources governing bylaws to make sure that even you local people yourself, you need to have something to govern you do not just misuse the plan that has been set. Because sometimes you find that you are all, you, local people themselves start to misuse those plans. Once you do, once you go wrong about it, you need to have penalties. And these are the sample of uh, one of the approved uh, governing bylaws, which is the district council have to approve, the village general assembly have to approve, and uh, have uh, proper documents which also document every use within a village so that it is no longer being had in the elder, elder man or woman in the, in the village. It has to be um, documented. You know. um, we do have a few challenges. One is division of village into... Okay. We do have a few challenges. Even if the system is good, but always challenges must be there. One of the challenges is division of villages in terms of administrative boundaries. Sometimes you find that the government, when they found you are so strong, they said, but, the, but your village have been divided into two villages. So you might find that the equal people who are strong within a village, they might be only in one side <laughs> of the village. So another new village, you might be a village of people who are a little bit weak. So now they go for those weak and they start to grab their land. So now we are saying for them, for the local people that don't divide your village. Don't allow any proposal to divide your village until we're all strong for it. Another thing is political interference. This is very common, in, uh, especially in the African countries, that if I need to be elected, now I need to go for, because nowadays uh, our, politi our political, uh, um, venture becoming a one who is really attracting even the professors in the university in my country are now going for for political um, will. And I told them, why are you moving? You are a professor, you are getting a lot of money, you are so famous, so why, why are you going for politics? They say, you know why? That way, it's the only work in the world which does not have any job description. <laughs> you work, you sleep, you go, you do whatever you want. <laughs> so for that, <laughs> so for that, uh, they have to interfere to make sure that whatever that is hindering their way to win, they have to disturb. 
Even if they know that this is the right way to help these people. But some of them may say, no for, no for this point. Later, yes, maybe, but now, no. We have to ban this process. And after he won, he started to say, this is the only way to go. I was saying no because I was not understood. Now he had, but remember, time goes. You stop something, grabbing is still happening. Another thing is about land use process. Yeah, it's an expensive process. It's a same. It's at a two uh, million. It's about like um, $23,000. Um, there's also government bureaucracy in approving these laws and policies. You might table the plan today and we get it after one year. Everything is set, clean, nothing comment, but just see, put a signature of somebody, takes a year. Yeah, um, oh, sorry, that's it. I think if we had replaced the word uh, fisherman with pastoralist, it was exactly the same. Yeah. Yes. Exactly the same. I feel I've heard this story many times. I, I understand that Edward has to run and get a bus. Uh, One question or so two maybe? Uh, do you want to ask a question? A, a and then we'll take some from the public? Yeah, we can try. Um, because what I wondered about is if there were particular subgroups within your community that you're having a hard time really reaching through this community process. And how you feel when, like for example, maybe you invite a group of the weaker people to come to a meeting and then they don't come. And uh, how do you feel about that and what do you do about it? Uh, thank you. Um, actually, there's no any work or of this kind, that is goes smooth. Always it is difficult. Because uh, people are, are worrying about the new thing. When you introduce a new thing, you have to say, what about, what happened? And uh, normally what we do, we give them time. For example, I don't work as a traveler. I go with them, I sit. I go with my tent, I spend time until I'm satisfied that now they have understood. I give more time with them. We go locally, we eat together with them, we walk with their cattle, and from that walk, my mission is to make sure that my message is well understood. I don't also dedicate to somebody who doesn't know really about the concept. I want myself, my message to be well understood from my word of mouth. Other groups, yeah, we we have to even even if those one who are against us, sometimes we bring them in a meeting. We sit together, and slowly they will understand what is going on. Yeah. How, how, do, you keep this moving? how do you keep this moving with the young people in your community? Okay. Yeah. Um, I started like a clubs for the community, the young the young clubs with uh, both girl and girls. And and uh, boys in schools. And what I'm, the, the message there is to try to say that the land, our land is our life. So they have to, that, that, that's the main message. That they have to understood that if you really want to live, you want to secure our land. And uh, I, there's also a concept of the pillar that I was mentioning to you, cow, natural resources, and the person is my side. They have to understand that pillar that when you, you cannot just say I'm a pastoralist, but you have no cows, you have no land. No, you are meaningless at that point. Those are the message that we have sent to our cross. Any other else wants to ask Edward a question or react to his story? Same old, same old. Okay. <laughs> well, then we'll let him take a bus. Thank you so much, Edward, Thank for sharing this moment. Thank you so much.